Hi, welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are here on the campus of beautiful Lynn University with Mr. Dan Sandoval. Welcome. Thank you. We're very happy to have you here and happy to have Puddles here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Puddles confided in me earlier that he was extremely uh, looking forward to seeing you. Excellent. He, well, we're happy to have him. Last night at dinner, I didn't bring him out, and he was he got pretty upset with me. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. He really got upset with me when I told him that we had those uh, those chicken wings uh -huh. for dinner. He got a little it was a little too much in his wheelhouse. Well, exactly, because yeah. he loves chicken wings, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or something like that. <laughs> I think he prefers duck nuts more, but yeah, whatever. I can understand that. So Dan is a professor of trombone here at uh, Lynn University and uh, doing great work. Well, I try. And I'm also have uh, some studies with Arnold Jacobs. That's right. I'm wondering if you can sure. recall any of that, uh, maybe your initial encounter. Well, my, my initial encounter with the uh, philosophy of Arnold Jacobs was with uh, Charlie Vernon. I first had a lesson with him in uh, 1979. I was a student uh, uh, at Brevard Music Center playing euphonium for a couple of years before that. And since I lived close by in the summers, when I wasn't a student there, I would drive over and just uh, hang out, try to get lessons. So I, I first got a lesson with Charlie. And uh, before that, I was mostly exposed to, well, here's a trombone, you blow into it, and you try to play the notes that are on the, on the page. And he sat me down and said, well, what are you thinking about when you play those first couple of notes? And you know, I was taken aback a little bit and said, well, I'm thinking about the trombone. And so he introduced me to what should really be in my head and told me where that came from in his case, which mm -hmm. of course was Arnold Jacobs. And so uh, over the course of a couple of years, I, I got steeped in the philosophy through Charlie. And then um, shortly after that, I believe it was uh, maybe 1984, uh, Bill Zafis and I, uh, we were working at Brevard that summer. We decided to move up to, uh, to Evanston to mm -hmm. be in the Chicago area and uh, moved into the infamous brass house there, which is where I met you. You were up on the third floor. Third floor. I My got, lair. Yeah, your lair. I got oh, a good... Uh, My nest. It, it was quite a nest. Puddles uh, would, be, would have been proud of that nest that you created. I there. had a good nesting instinct. Yes, I, I would say that's definitely true. Yeah. I was on the second floor uh, across the hall from Bill. Yeah. I had less of a nest. I didn't have... I showed up at the house with what I had with me and built from there. But uh, anyway, uh, we moved there and sort of the, the you were still a student at Northwestern at the time. Yeah. Uh, I was out of school and the, the idea was you got a day job and you took lessons and practiced. So uh, I was all gung-ho and I called up uh, Mr. Kleinhammer and uh, he of course was very accommodating and uh, we set something up for that uh, first week when I was settled in, and so I was ready to call Mr. Jacobs, and uh, and so to get what I'd been hearing from the horse's mouth, as it were, and uh, so I called him on a Sunday morning, as I was advised to do, and uh, he answered, and I told him who I was and that I'd like to get lessons, and I got the oh well this week looks uh, looks pretty tight. Why don't you call me again next week? So I was. Okay, well, thank you very much. Hung up and scratching my head. And so you guys told me that sometimes he does that. You know, he'll put some hoops for you to jump through to make sure you're serious. So I called him again the next Sunday. And he said, well, again, I've got a, a very busy week. Why don't you try me again next week? And I tried again the next week. And he asked me to call him back again the week after that. And I actually got pretty discouraged So I, because I'd already had... Uh, at least a couple of lessons with Mr. Kleinhammer at that time. So I, I kind of gave up on it for a, uh, a few weeks. And then um, I was encouraged to uh, sort of, you know, let him know what, what I wanted help with, that he's sometimes intrigued if you, you know, have a specific cause. If you have an issue. If you have an issue. So, yes. of course, I, I had plenty of issues to choose from, but, uh, you know, I told him uh, that uh, I was having specific issues with uh, evenness of sound from register to register and so he seemed intrigued by that and set up a lesson. So I uh, you know, went downtown at the appointed time and uh, was told to 
get that cup of coffee to take up to him. So, Give him a trigger. Yeah, I this was. Uh, I don't know if he was still teaching at his home at the time or had basically moved everything to the fine arts building. Right then, mostly. Yeah. So uh, I I didn't ever get to see the the fabled basement. Yeah. On South Normal, but uh, so I went to the fine arts building, went up and uh, and uh, introduced myself and. We got started, and just like in that first lesson with Charlie, he, well, I was playing, I think, Roshu, maybe number three, something like that for him, and he wanted to know what was I thinking about between those two notes, and while I was playing those two notes, and so it was just like starting back at scratch, uh, starting from scratch with that, uh, with that concept. But it was, uh, you know, incredible to just hear it from him, and to be in that room with all the, uh, all the accoutrements and and Gadgets. stacks of stuff. It was it was pretty amazing. Tube over here, tube over there. Just just you know a wonderful experience. So um, do you, do you, so what were you thinking? What did you tell him? Well, I had told him, of course, I that I was thinking of my best trombone sound in my head, and uh, he quickly figured out that that trombone sound wasn't very loud in my head. That I was still thinking a lot about. The instrument itself, and and thinking about the air too much, rather than studying the air apart from the instrument, and then building those habits, and then letting the air take care of itself as you play. So you're thinking right. about the process of air. The process, you're maybe thinking the, about how it felt or the slide mechanics. Or, yeah. So you had a you had a a sense of sound in your mind, but it just wasn't loud enough. Exactly. Is what he was. Exactly. And he uh, he also pointed out that he he could hear the you know the sound changes from register to register, and uh, he quickly zoned in on vowel sounds, and uh, what what sort of vowel sounds were, were I thinking? Of course, I said I wasn't really focusing on vowel sound vowel sounds, so um, he had me sing the music, and so you know I sang. Da di da da do di da, and and with a mix of of different vowels, and he and me said, "Well, that's what you're doing. Whether you know it or not, you're not keeping a consistent vowel sound mm -hmm. as you sing." And so uh, that was a big help, and I spent a long time uh, working on that over subsequent lessons. I didn't have. Uh, um, a regular series of lessons, like I did with Mr. Kleinhammer, with uh, with Mr. Jacobs, what I you know I would see him uh, every couple of months, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, he just always uh, built on that, found something else to to uh, work with. Yeah, it sounds like it was a a really helpful initial encounter. Yeah, just, absolutely. Uh, and he really zeroed in very quickly on mm -hmm. on what he could do to. Get you to be more consistent from register to register. Absolutely, that's great. Dan, you you um, went back um, subsequently for more lessons. What uh, what kept you coming back? What kept drawing you back to Mr. Jacobs? And what did he do for you? Well, uh, like the same experience, I think a lot of people had. Uh, he he was always finding something new to tell me. I think, and uh, you know, we would build on what we had had done previously but he he was always you know finding a new challenge with me and of course uh talking about air was a big uh a big part of that he uh, you know introduced me to his ideas of air of course the the breathe to expand don't expand to breathe which i found myself doing a lot you know i'd heard all the all of what we should be doing when we breathe so of course i'm sticking everything out where it should go but was a lot of air going in all the time, not always. Did he didn't demonstrate what he meant physically? Do you remember what he yeah. demonstrated? What it looked yeah. like? Yeah. Well, he would he would just breathe, and you know this big, deep, open sound of the air going in his body, and you know he, you know, Fill had, up. had his way, and you know he just went out in all directions, and it was it was amazing to see, see how natural that was for him. Yeah. And and you know even with um, you know his reported diminished capacity for air, how he was able to get as much pos as possible in there in as relaxed a manner as he could. Yeah. I, I just remember something. 
sometimes he would say the body can lie, you know, uh, in terms exactly. of the, the breathe to expand, don't expand the breathing. So he would, just for the audience, he would, this is something he would do, he would cover up his, his nose and mouth and do that kind of thing just to show shape change is possible without any air exactly. being involved. Right. Which, he did the same thing to me because I, I, I had very bad air habits. I was a half breather. Mm -hmm. Myself, so that was a that was a big a big deal for myself as well. Yeah. What else? Well, he I, I think he detected some things around the embouchure, and he he said to me, you know, if you were a regular student of mine, um, like associated with a school or something like right. that, he said weekly, I, I would have you shave that beard. I had a beard at the time, and uh, and then he could really get in there and see what's going on, and uh, you know. I would take that now as a hint to maybe at the next lesson I should show up and have shaved my beard, but I didn't. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I missed there, but I'll bet it was something good. Probably so. Yeah, but uh, you know, over the years I saw him. Uh, I tried to see him a couple of times a year, or you know, when I was off in South America playing, I uh, you know didn't see him for for years at a time, but. Uh, one of my fondest and most clear memories of him is the last lesson I had with him. It was in uh, April of '98, uh, right? Uh, you know, shortly before he died. Maybe yeah. what six months six or so? Months, yeah. He died in October of that year. And I was in Chicago. I, I was touring with Dallas Brass and had a few days off. I was in Chicago. I was staying at Charlie's house, and he said, uh, "Well, I've got a couple of hours lined up with uh, uh, with Mr. Jacobs. You want one of them?" I said, sure. So uh, we both went downtown, and uh, Charlie had his lesson, and uh, and I had mine, and I and it was on tuba, which all my previous lessons had been on on trombone, mm -hmm. on bass trombone, and uh, so I was I was a little more nervous because now suddenly I'm showing, you know, this this is his wheelhouse for sure, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, he said, well, what do you have for me? And since this was sort of a, a, you know, a little bit of a last minute thing, I photocopied a couple of uh, Blazovic etudes, a, a slow one and a fast one to play for him. And I, I figured, you know, certainly there's an hour's worth to talk, to talk about in there. So I played them for him and he, he didn't have a whole lot to say. He maybe pointed out a couple of things generally about air and uh, whatnot. And I played through both of them and, you know, kind of glanced down my watch and maybe 20 minutes had gone by. He said, so what else do you have? And so I explained to him, well, that's, uh, that's you know, I, I thought that would be enough. And he goes, well, let's see what we've got here. And he reached behind him on that table that was yeah. full of stuff. And he, and he grabs, do you know the Walter Smith top tones for the trumpet? I said, I'm familiar with the book. He goes, let's see. And he flips through. Oh, goes, no. Oh, how about number 15? And of course, my my familiarity with the book was about through number two or three. <laughs> so he puts this up on the stand, and I'm looking at it. It's in treble clef in the key of E. I'm playing an F tuba, and I'm just racking my brain trying to figure out how am I going to read the music. You know what what octave or what clef am I going to try to do where I'm not going to really get in trouble up high or be in finger mass down low and so I decided to play it just in bass clef and uh, started in on it and, and it, went, it went fairly well I guess but then he began to to pick apart and I remember there was a lesson with uh, Mr. Kleinhammer once where uh, I was playing something for him actually it was the Strauss second horn concerto um, that I would play a little bit of the first movement mm -hmm. as a solo for auditions, that sort of thing. And and he really took me to task on that, about what am I playing, is it really reflective of what's on the page? And so, you know, I thought it was, but what I found is I was playing what sounded good to me, and not necessarily what Strauss wanted, mm -hmm. or in this case, what Walter Smith. Well, Walter Smith wanted. So he he just 
began to go to town about yeah all your accents of course you're playing this but you know you've got to sing out on that on those uh high notes and there's an accent there i didn't hear an accent and, and all the little crescendos and and you know it, and it was a totally different lesson mm -hmm. again than i had had with him before where he was really talking about the music and the details in the music yeah. and how you have to you know be a great actor but get everything across that's in the music and that was that was very powerful for me and uh then of course we used up a good amount of the time with that and at the very end he he says uh so i like that instrument he said oh, do you mind if i play it and i said no not at all so he reached back and grabbed a mouthpiece and he said he hadn't touched a tuba in six months and put the mouthpiece in and just began to trumpet away on it, you know, in that mm -hmm. way where he could just play makeup fanfares. Yeah. And, and and I was just amazed at the sound he was getting getting out of the instrument. This was in eighty eight. Ninety eight. Ninety eight. Ninety eight, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, and again, you know, he wasn't doing well uh, with his health at all at that time mm -hmm. and, you know, only had a few months left to live, but it, it was amazing to hear that sound. Yeah, even then. Even then. Ten years after retiring and even then it was the 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 musical message was still there and still as strong as possible. And going back to the first lesson where that sound has to be so loud in your head that it can't help but come out of the instrument. That's what he was doing right then. From the beginning to the end, that's amazing. Yeah, amazing. Well thanks Dan for sharing that. Yeah. That's my a, pleasure. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that very much. Um, the puddles does too, and he he asked if I wouldn't give you uh, uh, something that's very dear and near to him, and this is a, a genuine Tuba People TV water bottle. Oh, look at that! As a token of of our Thanksgiving for your contribution. Oh, well, that is beautiful. Thank you. I will put that to good use because, of course, here in Florida, you must stay hydrated. Exactly. Puddles. Although it's not, it is um, aluminum, so you can put anything in it you want. Oh. Excellent. I appreciate that. Puddles, this means a lot. And you know what, Puddles, I have something for you as well. Oh my gosh. Since we do need to stay hydrated, here is a Fighting Knights Lynn University water bottle. Go Lou. Yeah. How about that, Puddles? Little Lou. Puddles says thanks. He's excited, he says. Oh, thank you. He can't wait to fill it up. He says, do you know of any um, little lakes where he can go try this uh, thing out? This Why? Right on the other side of the building is a, is a little lake. You know, he was yeah. reading on Wikipedia last night that there's some 7,700 lakes in Florida. So Really? Yeah, he's excited about that. Land of lakes. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. And now back to you. Well, um, Dan and I being together like this, it, it, it would not be um, appropriate if we didn't have a, a word or two to say about our dear departed Bill Zephus, um, such a great friend to us. Um, yeah. And uh, we lost him last, last summer, summer of 2014. And um, I think, uh, you know, we're prepared to toast his memory. And one of the great things he loved to drink was Diet Coke. Do you have any uh, story about Diet Coke and Bill Davis? Well, Bill always knew how much I liked Diet Coke as well. Not that that's a good thing, but um, the liking Diet Coke. But uh, oftentimes uh, at Brevard, which is where I saw Bill mostly, uh, you know, I'd be warming up before a rehearsal and he would drive up into the parking lot there, you know, and uh, come walking down and without a word, reach in his bag pull out a frosty can of Diet Coke, hand it to me, and just keep walking. As if he knew I needed one at that time. He sensed it. And Bill and I were roommates beginning in 82, and uh, he was definitely all about the Diet Coke in the fridge. Yeah. Um, he, he definitely had it stocked full of Diet Coke. And uh, so we thought we'd just toast Bill, toast Bill's memory. So, Bill? This is for you. Here's to you, Bill. Yeah, we miss you. Mm. Feel the burn. 
Exactly.